Okay, hi. This is Mike Davis with Lovecraft Easing, and today is December the 1st. We're in December 2013, and it's our regular Sunday video chat. And we had a really busy video chat last night. Lots of people watching, lots of people in the room. Uh, and I think uh, today everybody's getting ready to go back to work tomorrow and dreading it. So... And Rick's got a doctor. Rick's regularly here. He's got a doctor appointment tomorrow, so he um, can't make it today. He's got to do some diet stuff or whatever. If I, if I understood correctly, so <laughs> so I got a question. Oh, well, before I forget, um, F. Paul Wilson, the guy, the the author behind the Repairman Jack uh, series and author of The Keep and a lot of other books uh, is going to be a guest on the show sometime in the next month or two. Uh, we're working out a date so as soon as I know I'll let you guys know. So, and so Mandy's a big fan of F. Paul Wilson? Pete? Mandy's a big fan of F. Paul Wilson. Um, in fact, uh, years one of the first things that we, we did together was we, we read Soft and Others, uh, his, mm -hmm. a collection of his short stories. Um, he he's a big Lovecraftian. He you know he considers himself uh, the Lovecraftian author. Well, I'm glad to hear you say that because I you know I don't know him yet, and I didn't know that. I didn't know if that's just something he worked in the Repairman Jack and the um, what's he call that cycle? No, uh, the adversary cycle. Yeah, adversary cycle that yeah. uh, okay, um, relates to. Yeah. He's, the, he's written a, a couple of stories. The Barons is one. Oh yeah, um, which, yeah that's a good novel. Which is I really, I, I think, really good. Um, yeah. uh, and, a, and a couple other things. You know, the keep drops drops some uh, names here and there. Um, you know, I think the keep it sets up. You know, Repairman Jack and the Adversary Cycle, and it's not overly, it's not really Lovecraftian, but it sets it up. Right. But that said, I really, really enjoyed The Keep. I've read it probably three times. Uh, well, yeah. plus it's World War II, and I always like that setting as well, but it, it's just a very well written book. Yeah, yeah, it, it's a great, great novel. Um,. It it name drops some Lovecraftian things, and and you know and it, it it doesn't go too deep into a Lovecraftian theme, um but but it's good I like it and and he he's he, he has he has since as you say w uh, used it to weave both the Repairman Jack and his advers adversary cycle together, um it, it's he's he's done some good work. And you know he's re-releasing all those books slightly revised so that they can all be yeah. considered one cycle. Yeah, I put um, a list on the website a couple of weeks ago, um, and I posted on the on the not on the discussion board on the page uh, about thirty or forty minutes ago. The Repairman Jack series, you can read them all in order. Yeah, you definitely want to do that. Yeah. Um, I, I like some of his short fiction. Um, two of his stories come to mind. Uh, Soft is about a, a disease that makes your bones go away. Yeah, I don't remember that one. Yeah, and so you you literally see just people like trying to crawl around without... Well, they still have legs, they just don't have any bones. God, that'd be painful. Yeah, and then... The other one, which it, it's kind of a, a fun story, it's but it's called Lipid Leggers, and <laughs> it's about a future where the, the government has banned all high cholesterol foods. <laughs> eggs. Well, they, they do know what's best for us, you know. The eggs, dairy, all all the all cheese, all this stuff, and literally, you know. There's a black market now for, for butter. Well, you know, I don't want to stray too far off Lovecraft, but that's exactly what happens when the government 
makes something illegal. It, it creates a black market. Right. Where does it end? You know, alcohol, you know, you're drinking a beer right now. In the 20s, you'd be committing a crime. Yeah. You know, and it, look at this huge uh, black market it created. Yeah. So, uh, and, and it's funny that we don't remember these things. Yeah. You know, we don't learn at all from these kinds of mistakes. Um, because we did it the same, you know, the same. We did the same thing with weed. Mm-hmm. You know, so. Which anyway. I mean, who who would you rather run into at midnight in a bar? A guy who's been drinking uh, Jack Daniels all night, or a guy that's been smoking weed? Who's, well, who, who, ask who, yourself. Who, this is the question I always ask. Fight with you. <laughs> yeah, the question I always ask is, who would you want to get behind the car wheel of a car? Yeah. Now you know the guy who's drinking Jack all night. He's going to go off and he's going to he's going to go hurt somebody. The guy smoking weed all night is going to look at the car and say, "Nah," and walk away. <laughs> not, you know, he's going to go walk down the street to Seven Eleven get a bag of chips. <laughs> yeah, that's right. He'll be like, "No, screw that." <laughs> yeah. So yeah, F. Paul Wilson, um, he actually replied to me right away and said, "It sounds like fun. He'd love to do it." Um. So, uh, I'm if he yeah I'm glad to hear that he considers himself a big Lovecraftian and, and a Lovecraftian author because he's definitely worked in that theme to Repairman Jack and the adversary cycle and I'm yep. really looking forward to talking to him about Repairman Jack and his take on Lovecraft you know his his take on Lovecraft you know you've got that the adversary and the ally but right but it's not a Derlethian thing the the uh, you know good Good old ones or elder gods versus bad ones. It's the ally only cares about humans to the degree that he wants to win the earth in this game that he's playing with the adversary. It's just a small. The earth is a very small marble in their war. Right. And that's all he cares about, and that's why he's on our side. But he doesn't really care about us. Right. And yeah, and yeah it's what we can, what can we do for him, not what for what he can do for us. Yeah. So. Yeah, and if I remember correctly, to win the game, they have to, they have to win all the marbles. It's not a question of who gets more. Um, and if a and if a planet has sentient sentient beings, it's more valuable in their game. So. So yeah. Start with if everybody watching. Start with the keep, and then 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 read the Repairman Jack series in order. Well, and, and now he's making it a little bit more difficult with the the young Repairman Jack stories. Yeah, you can skip those if you want, but if you really want to get into it, you could read those. I'm not. I haven't read those. I I don't. I well, don't know. you know, yeah. teen fiction is a huge, huge market. Yeah, he's probably. <laughs> And that's a good idea for him to do it, I'm sure, mm. financially. Um, you know, besides the fact, forget the Lovecraftian stuff, Jack's just a badass. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I love yeah. his attitude about living off the grid, and um, he's not hes hes not real big on the government. You know, doesn't even have a Social Security number. Right, right, right. And he's he's at a re I forget which one is recent is uh set in Florida. Where oh yeah, where he goes to see his dad. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Um. The haunted air. Have you read all of them? Or is... I've read I've read some some of the more obscure ones. Um. I like Mostly, the haunted air. It was almost it was almost a ghost type story, and then you find out it's not. Or right. Say, but, but it's it it's a very it, it, I don't know. It's very atmospheric. Um, that's that's one of my favorites. So. Yeah, you know, there's for the adversary cycle, the tomb, um, reprisal. You know, there's there's so many of these books, and they're all good, but for the longest time, they were just so hard to find. Yeah. Um, even as paperbacks. 
Um, Especially and, and that, before the internet, because they these have been around since the eighties. These books. Right. 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 So. Yeah, I remember right after 9-11, Danielle and I, we had a vacation plan to the north, north shore of Lake Superior, and I remember taking the adversary cycle and, and reading it. So it's, it's kind of neat to, yeah, you know, reading this guy so many years ago, and now he's going to be on the show. It's, that's that's cool. Well, and, you know, that's how I felt when we sat, when you and I sat down at the table with Alan Dean Foster in yeah. Death Row. You know, here's a guy I read when I was growing up. And all of a sudden, I'm sitting next to him, talking to him. Yeah. That's just, that's just stunning. So. Yeah, I remember seeing Alan Dean Foster books at the, on the shelf at the Urbandale Library growing up, you know. And he's been doing this for such a long time, and he's... He, you know, you look at him, he doesn't look very old. He looks like he's about 55. Yeah. Yeah, but he's... He was right... Well, you know, he started right out of out of college, I think. He hit his stride very early. So, I mean, if you remember, he, he, did, the, he did the novelization for Star Wars. Yeah. And he did one of the, the first st standalone Star Wars books. And novelization for uh, several other things. He's done quite a few, I think. Right. Actually. Alien, The Thing, um, what was, uh, uh, yeah. Can't remember. It was really bad. Shadow Keep? It's a bad, it was a bad movie. Um, <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, but no, I. All, a lot of these things that we watched when we were kids, he he was there for. Yeah. There is no yacht. Yeah, I was about to mention that post to you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, who, so, who asked? <laughs> so uh, Stan Hart, I think. I can't even find the post now. Where the hell is it? Oh, here it is. Uh... Here it is. Yeah, Stan Hart asked about uh, Christmas, uh, Lovecraftian Christmas ideas and and Christmas carols. So if you don't know about the H.P. Lovecraft Historical Society, <laughs> all day long I swim in the sea. If I were a D one, terrify the tourists. You can get that. <laughs> you can get that. <laughs> CthulhuLives.org/solstice, which I am gonna post. They've got quite a few Christmas carols, which I just posted on the message board. Uh, it's an album, actually, isn't it? A very scary solstice. Yes, I, I think there's a, a second one too, isn't there? Oh, I'm not sure, but uh, there's the link. So, so that I think that there might be a second book. volume. Hmm. What'd you say? Uh, uh, nothing. I I said I thought there was a second volume. Oh, there might be. I haven't looked. Um. But as far as you know, as far as what to buy for Christmas, there is. I assume you're asking for me and what I want, Stan. <laughs> No, uh, I posted the link to uh, <laughs> to the Lovecraft Easing store, um, but Joe Brewers has has several um, Lovecraftian statues at my Lovecraft Easing store. He's really talented. Um, got uh, Eric Zahn, uh, Lovecraft's Cthulhu, which is a uh, based on the way Cthulhu, the way that Lovecraft drew him. Um, there's a what's it called? There's an Innsmouth guy there. There's several things. So if you're looking to give somebody a gift, I mean, the statues are always good. Didn't he do Brown Jenkin? Yeah, there's a Brown Jenkin too. Yeah, uh, I've actually got uh, both of them. I've got a couple of them right here. Here's a. Uh, 
Here is the um, Ensmith guy. You got a cane and everything. Pretty cool. Really like him. And then I can't decide which one's my favorite, but here's the Eric Zahn one. So pretty awesome. Joe's pretty talented. So looks like uh, <laughs> Matt wrote a already typed out a list of stories he loves. Here. Yeah. I saw that. Yeah, let's see what he's got. Studying Emerald. Yeah. Yeah, I agree, but I just I keep I keep seeing it over and over everywhere, you know? Yeah. Fat face, yeah. Black man with a horn, definitely. Mm, Crouch end. Crouch end's pretty good. I think N is better. Yeah. I could go either way on that. N is more. N is more cosmic. Crouch end is definitely Lovecraftian. Yeah. Now, if you were only going to pick one Neil Gaiman, he's also got Only the End of the World again, which I like that one better than uh, uh, Study in Emerald. Okay. Um, that's damn good. God, i got to refresh my memory on a lot of these. Salt Air. That sounds familiar. The Big C, Brian Lumley, The Barons of Paul Wilson. You know, I, 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 I'm surprised The Big C made it because that is, well, first of all, it's a Florida tale. Um, but that is, it, it's, I would make that a cosmic horror story, but not strictly Lovecraftian. Yeah. Um, it's a great story. But in many ways, it reminds me of the things that Colin Wilson did with, with the Lovecraft themes, taking the themes and 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 the, and the concepts, and writing around them, yeah. not writing to them. There's two lists I want I want to compile this week, and one of them is that that list of 25 recommended. I don't want to call it top Lovecraftian stories, but 25 recommended stories. You know, some of the we could maybe call it some of the best, and that way, <laughs> I don't get angry hate mail. Um, but I want to compile that with, you know, your help and, you know, maybe have you and Joe and uh, um, who else was on there? Sebastian. Uh, yeah. Send me, and Rick, sorry. Send me their thoughts and we'll just kind of put them all together. The other list I'm going to compile this week, a bit easier. Uh, I did it a couple years ago and I want to do it again and update it. And that's a list of good Lovecraftian Novels or collections available for Kindle, like under that are that are cheap, like under three or four bucks. Yeah, because there's quite a few of them out there, and there's some real junk out there too. But there's some good ones out there for cheap. For example, the uh, the Cthulhu Mythos Mega Pack, I believe, is ninety nine cents. <laughs> yeah. oh my God, I think it's got like eighty stories. Right. You know, it's got the uh, events at Porth Farm. Am I, did I say that title right? Yeah, I think uh, so. And a lot of others, you know. Yeah. Um, I, I actually don't know how much uh, Reanimators is going for right now on Kindle. For um, Kindle, I think it's nine ninety nine. Yeah, you know, since October. The price is slowly even creeping up. For and in fact, on a, a lot of books that I've been watching, the price is slowly even creeping up. And I think yeah, it's, it's just. Still nine nine. Yeah. I, I think it's Christmas. Well, I creeped my mega packs down. I was supposed to change them last night at midnight, but I haven't got around to it. So if anybody watching wants, watching wants Lovecraft easy mega packs, they're still two ninety nine each. And that'll probably change back to the regular four ninety nine tomorrow, but but jump on it by all means. 
Yeah. You've been seeing them go up, most books. I, I've seen a lot of a, a lot of not the Kindle editions, the hard the paperbacks or hardcovers. Things I've been you know wanting to get have been slowly creeping up. Yeah. Um, like every couple of weeks they add a couple cents. Um, you used to be able to get reanimators for like eleven twenty three, and I think now it's up over thirteen dollars. Hmm. Um, but buy. I'm surprised it's not priced at like fifteen or something. So that's still a good deal. It's fourteen ninety nine retail. Hmm. Is it still uh, in uh, Barnes and Noble? Yeah, yeah. I saw it there the other day. That's awesome, man. You're gonna be quitting your job pretty soon. No, no, I'm not. <laughs> no. Um. I I'd, I'd love to do that, and we've looked at retirement. You know, I am getting up in up in years. Yeah, you are. Um. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. But um, <laughs> I, I should be, you know, I should be able. I'll hit thirty years of my current job in five years. Oh wow! Yeah. Wow. But that will be many, many years before I'm sixty-two. And um, we had to play this the whole. When do you want? When have you had enough game? To, but do you uh, like the job? I mean, is it a job where you like get up and you dread going, or is it is it okay? I, you know, I use, there are there are days when I I really can't wait to get to work, and mm -hmm. then there are days when I just want to slip my wrists. And it's not the people I work for directly; it's decisions that are being made by politicians at, at a level that I will never be able to influence. Well, I, I'm not saying that reanimators is going to get you to where you don't have to work at a real job, but I do think you'll arrive there, relatively speaking, before <laughs> retirement, for sure. Well, the, yeah, the nice thing is that, you know, I, I we have a plan, and... I have a I I've put together some decent retirement packages. Yeah. So if and when I do want to retire, I can go writing full time, and we'll I'll still have a regular income from from packages. That's great. Um, yeah. Um, I remember. Uh, I don't know if I've told you this story, but y y you know how I grew up. I told you a little bit. Yeah. I got the hell out of there as soon as I could, and. I'm actually originally from Fort Worth. Um, it's kind of a coincidence. We're back down here in the Dallas area now. So we were in Iowa. I wasn't my family in, or was in Iowa at this. You know, I was in this cult. And so as soon as I was legally old enough, I got the hell out and I moved back down to Texas and stayed with my aunt and uncle in Fort Worth. My uncle got me a job at this. I don't remember the name of the place, but in Fort Worth at this bomb at this. It basically was a factory, and they were making bombshells. They had a contract okay. from the government, and they were making bombshells. So my job, my job was 10 hours a day, not eight, 10 hours a day was to stand on an assembly line and use these tools to, hey, it's Willem. How are you? How do I sound? You sound, you sound happy. happy. I've been having audio problems with my. Well, you sound when fine. I record on, when I record on YouTube, so I, I thought maybe this wouldn't work, but I sound okay. You sound yeah. fine. You sound fine. Okay. So uh, how y'all doing? I was telling my first job story, Willem, and then we'll we're gonna harass you. Um, okay. So I'm standing there for ten hours a day, and I'm using these tools. You know, I'm 18 years old. I'm, I weigh like 150 pounds. I got these heavy boots on me, and I got these. You know, you, you got the bombshells go on the assembly line, and you got You can't step away or anything. You got to make sure they're up to specs and everything. You go to the bathroom, and they start to pile up. I mean, and it's a half hour for lunch, and that's it. And I thought, oh my God, I'm gonna do something like this the rest of my life. 
this lady comes up to me. I don't know if I can make it till noon. This lady comes up to me and she goes, uh, kid, you know, you're really lucky to have this job. It's, it's good security. I've been here for, for 20 years. And I can't believe they hired you at 18, but, you know, you know, you should thank your lucky stars that you're here and hang on to this job. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, what, what have we come to when we're thankful for slave labor on an assembly line for 10 hours a day till we hit 65? I thought, I can't do this. i got to be self-employed in some way. Even if I can barely pay the bills, I have to work for myself. So. I hear you. You know, and I'm not saying that people have real jobs or stupid or anything. What I'm saying is there's some jobs that I don't understand how people do them every day. There's some jobs that are enjoyable. I, I want a job. I want a real job. I want a yeah. real job. I know, and then I'm telling this story, and Willem's looking for a real job right now. <laughs> so how's it going, Willem? Oh, it's all right. Um, not much is happening. I'm really taking it easy. Um, that's about it, really. I'm not really doing anything, and it feels great. But I do need to find a job. I'm just really, really anxious. What do you and like? What I, do you like I to miss, do when you get a job? Didn't, didn't you? Didn't you work in food industry? Well, I I can't because of my congestive heart failure. I I don't think I can do what I'm used to, which is heavy manual labor like janitor work or mm -hmm. kitchen work. I would love to go back to the pizza joint, but there's too much heavy lifting and stuff. So, uh, the church. Had the Mormon Church has a, a job finding agency, and they also um, find jobs with training. Because I think I'm going to have to be trained for some new kind of occupation. But um, I, I really feel the need to return to the workforce. Uh, I, it'll be great to get out of the house. I, I need something to do, and writing just isn't doing it for me anymore. I just don't care about writing at all. Well, you've got a lot coming out lately. You've had a, a lot of output the last year or two. Yeah, I, so, I've had too much. It's okay and, to rest. But, you know, yeah. it's and it's depressing. It, it it never used to bug me that my books don't bring in any money. And this is a new development. All of a sudden, it, it's beginning to bug me that I work my guts out writing books. And I get so little in return financially. That never used to bug me. You know, I always thought, you know, writing is my art. But ever since mom's death, I've had to become more responsible financially. And what writing I, doesn't, you know, writing doesn't bring me money. I, one of I the things that bugs else. me more than anything is, you know, talented authors like you, you're, you know, you're looking for a job and people like, Stephanie Mayer or, you know, and these Twilight Zone author people, and they're making millions. I mean, geez. Yeah, but, you know, those those stories are very few. I, I mean, there's a very few people that, and I wouldn't have, I wouldn't want to write the kind of books she has to write. Maybe she mm -hmm. enjoys writing them, but I, I wouldn't want to, not, I've never read her books, so I can't say if they're good or bad, but. I, I would hate to be trapped in a commercial where everything is so dependent on money and making lots and lots of money. I think I think there was, would be a trap in that um, because you would you wouldn't be thinking about artistic needs. You would be thinking about you know the the well, financial you know, reward. I, I think like a lot of things in life. I think really the key there, and it's it sounds simple, but it's it's. I'm sure it's very, very hard to do, and the key is balance, you know, uh -huh. and being able to write what you want and yet still getting, being able to pay the bills from writing what you want. Yeah. You know, not considering money over what you think you should be writing. Yeah. So. You know, my first job was I worked for a museum called the Jones Fantastic Show. I began as their janitor. And then I found a closet with a black cape in it and masks, and I began to um, 
they hired me to to walk around in front of the museum and attract people. And uh, and then they put the name of the museum on the back of the cloak, and I and I discovered a hat and wig that reminded me of Lon Chaney from the London After Midnight. So That's I began awesome. doing I began doing the makeup. I had that job for, I think, fifteen years. That was my first job was being a vampire, a professional vampire, <laughs> and it was it was great because I was really into theater, and and this was acting a role. I got to, and I would try never to break character. It was an acting challenge, but it was also fun. And it, it was exhibitionistic because I was out in public dressed as a, a, as a vampire and getting all this public reaction. Mm -hmm. It really, it really um, formed who I am today. Well, I've been working, and the artists have been working on your... Uh your tribute issue, which should be out on December the 5th. Hopefully I'll make that. Oh, boy. But that will cheer me up. These are, it's, it's, all of this is really great because even though I'm not in the mood to write, I, I'm, I really enjoy the feedback and, and um, like the, the Weird Tales interview, that made yeah. me feel really good. I like it helps me even though I'm not writing I like to continue feeling like a writer so these kind of acknowledgments really help me to to feel my accomplishment and I'm really really deeply appreciative of it so oh you're welcome I'm really I'm, I'm looking forward to it in, indeed there's some really good stories um I'm pulling up the list here but I think you know that uh um S.T. Joshi uh, wrote the introduction for the issue. The introduction, wow, fabulous. Yeah, and, uh, and Bob Price and did, does a monthly column. Uh huh. Or, well, it's, I guess we're every two months now, but he, he does a column every issue for me, and he, you know, I told him this was a W.H. Pugmire issue, so he wrote a column about you, so or you know, talking about you. Wow. So got that from it's, Bob it's Price. It's incredible and how long that. Bob and I have known each other now. It's What's that? Been many. It's it's incredible to think how long I've known Bob <laughs> since you know first buying those those early issues of Crypto of Pluto. What? We we go way back. It's pretty great. I can't wait to see. That was one of the reasons. fantastic things about the film festival was to finally meet Bob Price. That was great. He's a great guy. So we, we've got, uh, I'll just name a couple. Jeff Thomas wrote a new story for the issue. Richard Gavin. Uh -huh. uh, your buddy Joe. Pulver. Uh, uh -huh. I've got a Scott Thomas story. Sesqua Valley story. Wow. Yep. Scott and Jeff both wrote. And J I never know if I'm going to say his name right, but Jaya Prakash wrote a story. Oh yeah, yeah. And uh, I'm not I'm not exactly sure how to correctly pronounce his name either, but yeah, I, I read it, I don't say it. And then we've got a poem from Anne. Oh, oh yeah. wonderful! Yeah. So, are Still, any of the stories Eskimo Valley? Sorry. Do, are any of the stories set in Sesqua Valley? Yeah, Richard's, uh, if I remember correctly, is Sesqua Valley. Huh. Um, there's only one. They're all original except for one. The Scott Thomas story is a reprint. Uh, you probably mm -hmm. read it, The Storm Horses. Right, yes, yes. Um, but I, I was reading the Scott Thomas collection that I have, and right before I decided all this, you know, it, got to where I was choosing all the stories for the issue and I asked him if I could use it so well, so good. got a lot of people that love you it's gonna be a great issue excellent so maybe it'll inspire me to I I do want to try to work on this book of stories set in Providence but I, I'm feeling really uninspired and I don't want to write it unless I'm feeling really really inspired you know I don't I don't want 
I think one of my problems is I began to write just because I felt I was obligated to write because I have this wonderful setup. I have this nice office to work in. I have all this free time. So, you know, the little voice in my head says, you should be writing. But I prefer the voice that says, oh, isn't this a great idea? Let's write this. Instead of the voice, I, I want it to be a pleasure. I don't want it to be like homework. Well, you, at the moment, trying you've to written write so much in the last so couple of years, though, that I don't think you have anything to feel guilty about. If you need to take a break. No. Yeah, I mean, you know, I really loved I, I really loved writing Bohemians of Sesquil Valley, and I really needed to write that book. But I, I no longer feel that artistic creative need. And unless I feel that, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna force it. Just because What's the I one that's coming out next? I forget the title. My the last you, book? The one you dedicated to me? That one's called um Specters of Lovecraftian Horror. When's that coming out? Um, well, it hasn't actually been accepted yet, but I sent all of my stories to the publisher, um, Joe Mori, who um, he used to do Dark Regions Press, mm -hmm. and he began a new press called Dark Renaissance Books. So if he accepts the book as it is, he wants to bring it out in time for World Horror Convention in Portland next year. So okay. that's next next spring, I, I believe. When is World Horror? Is it is that spring or is that spring or summer? I think it's spring. I've never been. All I know is that the uh, the film the film one is in April. Yeah. So. And I'm not really in the mood to go to conventions, but if he brings the book out for the convention, I think I will have to go. So. Yeah. So whatever. We scared, we but, scared um, into silence. Yeah. So um. So it's called it's called Specters of Lovecraftian Horror, and a great majority of of the stories, my stories in it, are things that you published in the easing. Mm-hmm. That have never been published in book form, and um, so I wanted I wanted them to be in a book. So, so um, they're in the book, and then David and I wrote a short novel of around thirty three thousand words, mm -hmm. and uh, that will be the one real brand new piece in the book. And I I do have one piece. Um, I can't remember if it's been published or not. I don't think it has. So there's another new story. So, um, but it's, What's the novel it's a about? Very, I think it's, What's huh? the novel that about? Um, let me, let's see. Um, nice tree, Pete. Oh, thank you. Did you ever, Mike, did you ever publish something called Through Sunset's Gate? No, that doesn't ring a bell. All right. So I think it, it's, it's, it's a prose poem vignette thing that I meant to send to you, but I forgot. Mm, okay. So that's going to be one of the brand new stories. Okay. But, but, you know, the other stories include An Idol on a Filth, A Thousand Smokes, Elder Instincts, O Lad of Memory, and... Shadow, descent yeah, into all, shadow yeah. and light. Um, it'll be great to see those in print. Yeah, it'll be it will be an unearthly awakening. All the things that you published first, so <laughs> they will finally be in a book. Awesome. So that felt good because uh, I wasn't in the mood to write a bunch of new stuff for the book, and I thought, what can I do? And then I thought, oh yeah, the Lovecraft easing has all those things that I've. That I I haven't had in, in a book, so I'll use that. So it was very convenient for me, since I'm feeling lazy. Uh, <laughs> and so you what are you up to, Pete? What's that? Okay. What new projects are you up to? Oh, I um, well, I was just about to ask you about. Uh, did you submit the Conqueror Womb? The who? The uh, Conqueror Womb, the Martian Migraine Press. Conqueror Womb. Yeah. The Shub Niggereth anthology? 
Oh, <clears throat> I, I'm not feeling inspired, so I, I think I said no. Okay. All right. Um, I'm giving, I'm, I'm, I'm saying no to most anthologies lately because I just don't. Um, I'm not feeling yeah. inspired, and I'm feeling lazy and apathetic toward writing. So I just, yeah. So I, yeah. They did invite me, and I said sorry, no. Okay. All right. I I just said them so yeah. 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 Um and you're right. I was I was hard I'm having well, I had some writer's block for two weeks. Uh-huh. And that you know, that may not count as writer's block. That may just be well, No, it does. It, yes. Um and you know, what I did was I moved on to another project and, and finished that and then came back to it and then quickly banged something out. Um, right. The the second novel is has been paid for. Oh, um, good. I signed a contract awesome. for that. Awesome, man. We're targeting that for release in August. Um, What's the title of that one? Right now, it's called The Weird Company. Is that the sequel to Reanimators? Uh, Doctor Hartwell and Mister Elwood will appear uh, in The Weird Company. Is it a sequel, or is it, or is it just the, like the same characters? Um, well, you need to you, read Reanimators first. I, if, I mean, yeah. If you've read Reanimators, um, you'll know at the end a, a, a small team team of people breaks Hartwell out of the asylum. Okay. Uh, it is the it's this group of people that are going to need him for something. So. So August, huh? August. That's um, awesome. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty excited about that. Um, I just got a contract for a an anthology of of um, stories that are are united by a theme of vengeance. Um, it's oh. called it's it's called Fossil Lake. And uh, Fossil Lake, why does that ring a bell? Who's doing that? Uh, Christine Morgan. Oh, I guess I don't know her. Okay. Um. Uh, there, yeah. So that'll be coming out probably soon. Um, I just was told that uh, Tales of the Shadow Men 10 came out today, which has a short story in it called Revenge of the Reanimator, set in Paris just after World War I. Um, with a... a a, a cameo by Herbert West. So, well, the uh, the I need to think of a good title for this. So suggestions are welcome. Uh, we're as you guys know, you guys have already sent me your your essays. We're doing a Cthulhu Mythos. I'm doing a Cthulhu Mythos uh, uh, book, and it's a basically instead of one guy's opinion on. The mythos. Uh, it's it's current Lovecraftian writers. Um, so I think well we've got twelve or thirteen people. Um, and Mark Rainey sent me his this weekend a couple days ago. I just got got a chance to read it today. It's pretty awesome too. Uh, I like both of you guys. Um, so that one's know? coming along. I I hope to have that published in April also. Um, I'm just looking through it because I hi highlighted it. That was my first impression of Lovecraftian horror. A deep sense of foreboding creeping through my brain. Every unknown sound putting me on the alert and preying on my senses. It was wonderful, fantastic. So, he's got a damn good essay. That book's coming along. I'm pretty happy. Are you? That's yeah. good. That's good. Um, I'm I so glad it's working out for you. I know you're taking a big risk here. Um, Why do you think that? Well, no, no. In terms of of, of not m risk is not the word. I'm, I'm you're taking a big leap. Yeah. Um, risk is the wrong word, but you're you're moving well, into. Well, I think I think it is a risk these days publishing books. Mm -hmm. Um, but. I think Mike is 
has an advantage of the easing and so many followers that right. the easing itself is a good tool for promotion that a lot of other publishers or editors may may lack. True. Sure. Well, the and and thanks both of you guys. The the thing we've got we've got you know for example we we've got ST's take and opinion on the Lovecraft mythos and it's valuable. You know what he has to say is very valuable. Uh, you know and Bob, but what this is about is you know authors that are writing Lovecraftian fiction today. What's their take on it? Uh, and kind of put them all together and try to form some kind of picture, um, a mosaic from all of those those thoughts. Um, I just got to think of a better. And the essays are, that I've received so far are just so awesome. I got to think of a better title than Cthulhu Mythos Essays. <laughs> so. So, yeah. Oh, you mean something like from um, Miskatonic monographs, or yeah, I like that. That's pretty uh, cool. Yeah, you know, the Miskatonic University Literary Review. <laughs> it's got to be something that says immediately when someone sees the title. It basically says in in, in a title that this that this is current author's take on the mythos. Oh, Cthulhu Today. Oh, I like that. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's that's excellent. Yeah, Cthulhu Today and then a there subtitle. Should be a of, sub yeah. There should be a subtitle, yes, of New Essays on the Cthulhu Mythos. Right. Yeah. That's I like that. Cthulhu Today. I'll write that one down as a possible idea. <laughs> if anybody watching has an idea, too, now that you have... Um, I don't know. I just think it. I think there's a hole there that needs to be filled, you know. And I want to. I really want people to understand the opinions of of you guys. Uh, your take on the Cthulhu mythos. You guys that are writing, you know, lots and lots of Lovecraftian stories. You know, not a not a scholar's take. Not an editor like me. You know, I've written one or two, but I'm not. I'm not constantly doing it, like you guys are. So, so, and, yeah. and I think you got the response that you wanted on that idea. You know, a, a lot of these, a lot of writers just put this stuff out and they never get asked, where does it all come from? Right. And, and why did you write that story? And it, it's nice to be asked every once in a while. Well, and for, you know, also, for me, yeah. For me, the answer is uh, it, it always returns to Lovecraft mm -hmm. and my passion for Lovecraft's fiction. That that's that's where I get my energy, and that's where I get so many of my ideas and inspiration. Uh, I can return to Lovecraft again and again, and he always inspires me. He excites me. It's just I'm a real Lovecraft fanboy. You know, I'm totally into Lovecraft. Well, yeah. and, and you know, every the time, person you know, that. Go ahead, Willem, I'm sorry. It's just every time I return to him, I find new things that excite me and inspire me. It, it never ends. And then I, I can read a book by S.T. Joshi or, or other, um, you know, scholars, and they, they, they discover new meanings or new aspects of Lovecraft's fiction, and then that inspires me. It, it just, there's, it's like this never-ending well of, of, of wonder for me. Yeah. Um, you know, and the, and the person that is out there that have, that have just gone through, say, love, that have just discovered Lovecraft, and they've read Lovecraft stories, and they want to they want to read more Lovecraftian stories. But they also want to know what is it really all about? You know, the people writing today. You know, what if you if you came across that new person? The idea, the main idea behind this is if you came across that new person, they're like, what is this all about? What does this mean? Then that's you saying to them, 
here's my take on on it, or at least an aspect of it. Mm-hmm. You know. So, got some good uh, suggestions for, for here. Me, for. Yeah, for me, there's a great desire to belong to the to the club that began when Lovecraft was alive, and he had all these people that were really into his kind of um, mythos and, and stuff. And it's mm-hmm. and when I when I first read the Derelith book, uh, Tales of the Clue Mythos, and then I read the book by Lynn Carter about the mythos, it just I. I wanted to belong to that. It was it was like a a club or or a secret society that I wanted to belong to. And the way you you belong to it is you do your own thing. And you know, yeah, I I when, totally totally agree. That that really really excites me being part of the club. Yeah. And you know, right. reading about you know Lovecraft writing back and forth with these guys. And you know what? We're continuing that today. I mean, if Lovecraft, this is the 21st century way of doing it. I, if Lovecraft was alive today, he'd be on the internet, you know, writing back and forth, and being he'd be a part of yeah. today's club. Uh, you know, that's very exciting to me. The community that we're all a part of. Yeah, and you know, it, it's kind of interesting because in in sort of a like a, a chainmail kind of way. I can chase my way back to the source. And, you know, you can connect the dots between Campbell and Lumley and Derleth and and Block and Lovecraft and, and say, I am part of this grand tradition. Exactly. And yeah. yeah. That's really well said. I'm uh, yeah, exactly. You know, and, and you know, I will, I will tell you. know, we've talked about this before. I, I was, I've been reading Lovecraft since I was four, and you know, I can remember picking up Willem's um, stories when I was sixteen. Oh wow! And and not fully understanding them, but knowing that there was something special in there. You know, and and Joe Pulver's first book came out. You know, probably my first year in college. Nightmare's Disciple. Yeah, and and these are, and 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 we talked about off screen. We talked about Alan Dean Foster earlier. I mean, Alan, I grew up on Alan Dean Foster's books, and while he hasn't, con- he got his start in Lovecraft, and now he's he's moved on to bigger and better things, but. Um, he still comes back to it every once in a while. Yeah, and it's it's important to to note that being part of the club, the community, it's not it's not just scholars, not just editors, and it's not just uh, writers and authors. It's you know if you're if you're if you're reading Lovecraft, you're part of this community. You know you're talking about this stuff. Um, you know you're. It, you're part of it. It's not. It's not this elitism, where if you're not a writer, then you're crap. You know, or if you're not an editor, then you're nothing. That's that's not the way the the Lovecraftian community works. That that was very apparent at Necronomicon. Yeah. Nobody was above anyone else. We were all together as Lovecraftians, and no one was cooler than anyone else. We were all equally valid. It was like we were a family. It was so wonderful. Yeah. Well, I, I, you know, it is a family. I, I really feel that way. That's, that's why, I, you know, that's why these video chats are so important to me. You know, being able to talk to you guys face to face instead of having to wait to do it once or twice a year. You know. Yeah. Um, that's too long. So yeah, I'm excited about that essay book. I got some good suggestions here on the message board. Cthulhu de Jour, uh, from the desk of Relay, the Arkham Ar- the Arkham Archives, uh, the Pen of Cthulhu. <laughs> oh no, that's clever. Who who because the there's of a Cthulhu? part of of Squid Anatomy that's called the Pen. Oh really? Yeah, there's this kind of cartilaginous 
uh, backbone they have that keeps them extended that way is called the pen. Really? Yep. That's <laughs> uh, Kimberly's suggestion. Actually, she's got several of them. So yeah, I'll have to think about that. I, I really like Cthulhu today too, with a with a uh, subtitle. subtitle. Right. Right. Yeah. So. So you got your tree up already. We got some Christmas decorations. Yeah, you guys, we don't have the tree up yet. I guess somebody said they hadn't seen, they didn't see the tree last night. So there's the tree, and all its 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 glory. Yeah, let me put you on the screen here. There we go. <laughs> nice. Did you guys put it up yesterday? Um, my parents came in for Thanksgiving, and um, we put the. We went, went Friday morning and bought the tree. I cut it and shaped it on Friday afternoon. And then we were supposed to decorate it Friday night. Um, but uh, at the last minute, my wife and girls got tickets to see the Rockettes. Um, so they went there. And then we decorated Saturday morning. So it was there last night. Well, I put up this afternoon, I put up uh, on the website, I put up a banner. Uh, happy Holidays banner Steve Santiago made for me. Oh, nice. Wishing you a happy Eldritch Holiday. <laughs> oh. What are, those little, what are those little flying guys with the little wings and everything? He drew those. I forget <laughs> who name. So. It is now officially the Christmas season because the banner is up at Lovecraft Easy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I'm really excited about Christmas this year. All right. Well, you should be. Like, you've been through some stuff, and everything's worked out. You've made it through the rain. Yeah, we don't. We don't really have very much money for presents this year uh, compared to last year. But it's still. It's just. You know, that's not what it's about. You know, it's just this holiday mood, and we watch Christmas Vacation. <laughs> the other day when we were putting up that's an annual tradition. Chevy Chevy Chase. <laughs> yeah. While we were putting up the decorations. So I think it would be I've neat. been watching a, I've been watching a lot of the movies on Hallmark Channel. Oh <laughs> I yeah. I never used to do that. I never used to do that, but this year and and I find them very charming actually. You know, Maybe actually I, I, I No, I think they can be. When I was younger I would have probably sneered at it. But oh yeah, yeah. But not anymore. Um, yeah. It's a kind of warm feeling. Are they doing a lot of Christmas shows already then? Yeah. On Hallmark, on Hallmark Channel, it's it's nothing but Christmas movies. Oh, well, that's cool. All day, every day. Yep. <clears throat> you know what I would like to do? Um, I should make a note, post this. But for the, I'm sure there's Lovecraft fans out there that. You know, maybe don't have anybody to celebrate Christmas with. Um, we could do like a Christmas chat or something, just not nece not on Christmas Day, but somewhere around Christmas and do kind of a get together, Christmas get together. Something to think about. What's the calendar look like there? Sorry. Christmas is on a on a Wednesday. Yeah. Let me pull it up. Yep, it's on a Wednesday. And so is New Year's Day. Hmm. So a lot of people have Tuesday will have Tuesday and Wednesday off. I guess it depends on your job. If yeah. Nice thing is Danielle being a teacher now. Her and Logan get the same. Yeah. Uh, time off. You know we can't talk about Christmas and and not mention horror for the holidays. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, if, if people are looking for a Christmas present for their, their Lovecraftian, Horror for the Holidays, edited by Scott David Anilowski, was just, it's an incredible anthology. It's mostly Lovecraftian. There's a few non-Lovecraftian stories in there. Um, it's really good. And Scott's story in that about Christmas is just terrifying. Yeah. That is a good book, and it's got a great cover, too. Yeah, great cover. So, yeah. Yep. yeah, that's true. That would be a great Christmas present. That would be uh, a great Christmas present. 
And they reprinted uh, the festival in there too, didn't they? Yes. So. Now I'm trying to remember someone who all did a Christmas uh, story in that. I'm gonna grab it real quick. Yeah, I, I'm, 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 I'm not next to my books. Um, I rearranged my books so that all the novel, my Lovecraftian books, so that all the novels are together and all the anthologies and collections are together. You know, short stories. But here it is, word for the holidays. So check out, check out everybody that's watching. Check out this cover. <laughs> that's pretty awesome. And then there's one. There's a lot. There's a lot of good stories in here. I'm trying to think of the one that's just. I probably won't be able to think of it. Oh, Bob's got a story in here too. Robert Price. Yeah. Robert. Thomas Ligotti's got a story in here. Hmm. Yeah, it's a damn good book. So what are the Christmas stories? The Christmas stories are... Oh, God, I'm not going to say this right. Cram Push Knot by Joshua Reynolds. I published him. Uh, the Christmas Eves of Aunt Elise, A Tale of Possession and Old Gross Point by Thomas Ligotti. Uh, Letters to Santa by Scott David Anolowski. Is that right? Yeah. Keeping Christmas by Michael G. Zemanski. Zemanski. And The Nativity of the Avatar by Robert M. Price. Okay. And for those that don't know, it's not just Christmas. It's other holidays, too. Like, uh, Oh, here's The Horrors of Yule. Oh, Keeping Festival. That's the one I was trying to think of that I really, really liked. Uh, Keeping Festival by Molly Burleson, 229. Yeah. You know, that, that uh, Letters to Santa was really chilling to me. So. I'll have to read that, reread that one. Yeah, Thanksgiving in here, Yule, Halloween, and other holidays. So, yeah, that's a good holiday yeah. gift. So. What else can we talk about? Well, I was going to ask Willem what he's reading right now because I know he's doing a lot of reading. Um, I'm reading a lot of uh, Shakespearean criticism, um, specifically on the sonnets, and um, <clears throat> I'm reading a, a biography on Milton, and um, those are the two. Those, those. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm reading. I'm rereading Dante. I kind of do that every holiday season. I like to return to Dante. Hmm. That's my reading. I bought uh, that Beyond the Rift on Kindle last night, Pete. Okay. I read that island story you guys recommended. Okay. And, and what did you yeah. think? I liked it a lot. Yeah. I posted Great. a link to that um, that PowerPoint presentation he does. About oh, you did? Where yeah, it's on my um, it's on my home page. I posted it, my uh, Facebook page. I posted it last night, right after the show ended. Oh, okay, all right. Um, if you want to list, if you want to link to that, that's okay. just it's it's terrifying what he does. Um, he does a corporate presentation on biomedical research that just chills you to the bone, and it has a, a particular Texas tie-in. <laughs> it does, huh? Yeah. So. Okay, I'll link to that. Oh, and, and then, for those that don't know, um, St. Joshi's "I Am Providence" is now available for Kindle, uh, oh. both volumes. Which the nice thing about that is, of course, it's all print's always nice. But the nice thing about having "I Am Providence," a book like "I Am Providence" on Kindle is, is it's now searchable. If you want to look something up. Right. You can go in and search for it. You, now you know you know what would be nice. Hmm. Now that I think about it, a Kindle version of of selected letters. Yeah. 
I mean that. Cool. Yeah. <clears throat> well, yeah, that would they're, be. They're working. They're they're working on a on a on a on a disc form of all okay. of the letters, but I think it's gonna. Be, I think that's a long ways off. Yeah, I'm sure it is. <clears throat> but you know, it's like um, they they did this with the uh, essays. Mm -hmm. They put all all of the essays on a disc. This is the the five volumes of Lovecraft's essays. Who, who so did? They, um, Hippocampus Press. Okay. All right. So dumb question: Who who owns the copyright to Lovecraft's all of Lovecraft's letters? No copyright. There's an actual there's an actual person who is in charge of it. it it's, I don't know. I can't remember the guy's name. Um. <clears throat> but there, there is an actual H.P. Lovecraft estate. Huh. How it got set up, who did that, I have no idea, since there are no living relations. No, I, I, know I, I'm I, kind of a, I know I'm kind of an idealist, but I, th I think it would be real. It would, it would be really neat to have all Lovecraft's letters online, you know, like on a website devoted to that. Uh, of course, that would be searchable too. I think that would be really, really neat. Yeah. You know, available to everyone, free of charge. Oh, you're just a dreamer. I know that ain't gonna happen. Yeah. Well, like, you can say that Penguin I'm a dreamer, book, but I'm not the only one. In the Penguin books, it says um, the stories in this volume are reprinted by arrangement with Lovecraft Properties LLC. So whoever the hell that is, I don't know. It's just, I don't know enough about this, but doesn't it strike you as strange that Lovecraft's letters are copyrighted by somebody or owned by somebody? I, no, I, I think um, because they are a huge, they bring in a lot of money when they're published. And I, I think, you know, a literary estate would own all the writings, not not just the fiction or poetry, but all the writings mm -hmm. uh, of an author, especially when those writings are being published as the letters are. Mm -hmm. if, Have you if, read, if read a lot of the writings? Uh, I've read a lot of the letters too, Pete. I have all the original five volumes. Mm -hmm. I've read a lot of them. Um. Some of them are, are really good. Some of them are tedious. I'm I'm starting very slowly to get into them as I have time. What he is probably an obvious answer, but what it, what attracts you guys? What's fascinating to you guys about reading his letters? For me, it was the letters that made me a Lovecraft fan. It it was discovering how delightful his personality was in his published letters when I first read the Arkham editions. Um, <clears throat> and I, I love it when he when he talks about his own writing, which he, he doesn't do very often in his letters. But um, it, it just, it, it reveals Lovecraft as a personality. Mm -hmm. And it's a personality that, I, that, that completely captivated me. And it comes across so strongly in his correspondence. So that that was my my big reaction, and it it really solidified my being a Lovecraft fan, mm -hmm. and it carried on into my own personal. I I began to date my letters, you know, in the 1700s, like Lovecraft did, and and I began to spell words in the archaic way that he did. Something else it, you it, did well that I totally noticed, um, you know, I noticed almost right away was, uh, that you were there. You you took the time if somebody wrote to you you know, a young writer or a new writer and took the time to write to you for advice or your take on something. Lovecraft himself was really good about that and, and you've said to me more than once that you wanted to carry on that tradition. Yes, it, it was Lovecraft and Robert Bloch really inspired me to do that because Robert always had time for his fans and, and so did Lovecraft and Lovecraft was extremely generous in answering letters um, 
you know, the, the fans would find his address through Weird Tales. He'd have letters forward from Weird Tales. Mm -hmm. And he, he really, some people criticize and say that he spent too much time um, answering his fan mail and trying to encourage the younger writers. But um, I, I admired that, and, and I, I've tried to carry on in that tradition. You know, I got I get the feeling you guys would know better than I, but I get the feeling that that was one of the things that made him the happiest when he was returning when he was writing letters and returning uh, answering letters uh, to friends and fans. You know, it was almost just it, it was his archaic yeah, it, it was for me, sorts. It it was his form of socializing, and I think he really needed it, and he delighted in it. You know, otherwise, he wouldn't have spent so much time and energy in, in his correspondence. It, it really, it, it helped. It helped him to form his ideas and um, to confront new ideas and new attitudes towards everything in life. I, I, th I think he thrived on it. Yes. It's almost a archaic internet in a sense. You know. Yeah, I mean, between that and the the amateur press association stuff that he did, and the the the, the little journals that he would publish on occasion, mm -hmm. um, this was his contact with the rest of the world. And being trapped as he was in in his his family situation or or lack thereof, these are the people he wanted to talk to. Uh, there, you know, there's he has that reputation of being the the outsider and the loner. He was extremely active. He was right more active. You know, he was so active. He was always doing something. He was always going somewhere. A lot of you know, he loved to he loved to go on you know traveling, and, and a, a large part of that was to meet other writers. Right, but he would to meet his correspondents. It wasn't just. Him going to look at you know um, historical sites and old buildings. He went to meet the people that he wrote to. Yeah, he was, yeah. He was very very social. Right. Um, years ago, when the first El Spray de Camp uh, biography came out, it mm -hmm. suggested that he was sickly and a recluse. Everybody sort of bought into that, but when you read his stories particularly the ones that are set in Providence. And he talks about walking down streets and, and seeing these buildings and and going walks for miles and miles and miles to these remote locations. It's clear that he's drawing on personal experience. That he may that that he was actually a very active person. Um, a, just not with the, his immediate family. There's a book by, what's his name, David Webb? I'm looking it up right now. David Webb? No, I'm sorry. It's, that's got to be wrong. Uh, Walking with Cthulhu um, is the name of the book. Right. And also Hayden. there's the um, uh, Scott and David God's Word. Uh, David Hayden. Sorry, David, go ahead. Um, uh, I think it was David Godward did a book called um, Lovecraft's Merrimack Valley. Mm -hmm. and it just talks about all the places that Lovecraft visited in in that area and how it included in various pieces of his, of his work. Uh, yeah. I have not read this, but it, it it's it a great book. Got his walks and everything. Yeah. Walking with Cthulhu is on Lulu by David Hayden. H A D E N. Right. And I've not read it. I don't know if it's good or not, but uh, mm, what I know of David Hayden, it probably is good. Yeah, he's very meticulous. Yes, he's extremely meticulous. I, I've got to say this is probably very, very accurate would be my guess. Mm. I'm, I'm after, Lovecraft's mother, after Lovecraft's mother died, he, he rarely stayed home. If he had the money, he went traveling. Yeah. Um, he went... You know, he went to conventions in Boston and sightseeing. He went to Canada. He, I mean, he went to Quebec. You know, that was he he um, 
he didn't stay home if he had the money. He was always going somewhere and meeting people. I, I was. Go ahead, Pete. Sorry. Uh, I've just recently reading. Um, David is putting out a, a David Godsword is putting out a, a collection of of essays on uh, Lovecraft in Florida. Mm-hmm. And um, apparently, when he went to Miami, he went on a glass bottom boat tour. No kidding. Uh, Biscayne Bay and saw coral reefs for the first time. <laughs> and then when when he gets back up to, to Providence, he writes The Shadow of Rinsmith. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, this this book is um <clears throat> his tra- this this is his his traveling writings and they fill up an entire book of almost 250 pages. What's the name and author and, and editor of that? This is from the Collected Essays. This okay. is volume four. And this is his entire travel writings. No kidding. And um, it's delightful. It even has has his um, his maps that he, he drew maps of the places he visited. And when oh, he wow. found houses that he liked he drew sketches of houses. I mean, you know, he was really, he was real he was, he was really into traveling. And um, this is a, it's a fascinating book. But you know, he wasn't, he wasn't a stay-at-home recluse by any means at all. It's amazing what I learned from these video chats uh, too. I was also reading in uh, the Kindle version of I Am Providence. I was reading it uh, a couple of days ago uh, about uh, you know the amateur press and how it basically saved him. You know, that's what he wrote in an essay was that the gift that the amateur press gave him was life itself. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hmm. What uh, if someone was going to read Lovecraft's? Wanted to wanted to start reading Lovecraft's letters. What would you guys recommend? Where would you recommend they start? You know, Barlow or somewhere else. I, I'd start. I'd start with the Arkham House volumes. Just yeah, they're highly edited, but they're they're delightful. Um, <clears throat> his correspondence with Robert E. Howard um, gets very tedious. And and they they were two very keen racists, so it mm. it, it can be kind of you know depressing to read the, their their bigotry. Um, his letters to Derelith are 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 great, but they they mostly discuss his write their writing, and and that can become a bit monotonous because it's on Lovecraft's side, it's it's almost completely discussing Darla's fiction. So if you're not a fan of Darla, you know, mm-hmm. it becomes rather tedious, I would think. But for a general selection, there's um <clears throat> actually this is a great this would be maybe this is a great place to start. This is uh this mm-hmm. is his letters used edited so that they form a, a biography in his own words. Really? Lord of a Visible World? Well, Lord of a Visible World. Okay. And um, they're arranged chronologically, and, and they let Lovecraft tell the story of his life. Um, that would be a great place that was, to That start. would be my first choice. It's excellent. Um, you know, what, refresh my memory, what's the story where he's talking about uh, you know, there is a, a writer in this area, a mystic in this area. You know, you know, you guys remember what I'm talking about? Yeah, it's the shadow from the steeple. No, I'm sorry. The, the oh, it's the one where he kills. Um, is this a story by Lovecraft? I think I, so. I think it's actually by Block. Oh, I think it's the that's from yeah. You, you think another you know, shadow from the steeple? No, I think it's the Shambler from the Stars. I think it's the Shambler from the Stars. Yeah, you know, 
I don't know. So I probably won't even be able to articulate this very well. But you know, reading that 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 strikes a chord in me. That's so fascinating. Uh, you know, because of its reflection in real life as well. You know, that that these guys with these similar interests interests uh, over these hundreds of miles kept connecting. You know, and you know, fictional as well as Lovecraft's correspondence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Lord of a Visible World. That sounds like a great place to start. Lord of, yeah, I, that that would be my first choice. You know, did uh, St. The St. Basically, what what did he do? Go through letters and lots of letters and arrange these. St. And David Schultz. They um they have a general introduction, and then each section um is prefaced with a little essay. <clears throat> Or, or a little beginning, and it just like childhood and adolescence, and it mm -hmm. goes on through marriage, and um, it's just it's just a it's just a very basic story of Lovecraft's life, culled from his from his um, correspondence. It's great. It's just you have you have the essentials of his biography. In his own words. Who published that? Um, Ohio University. I think. I think I've identified my Christmas wish gift. Ohio University Press. Yeah. It should be highly available. It was published in 2000. There should be quite a few copies on Amazon, I would think, Let's of the see. paperback at least. Lord of a Visible World. Okay. Autobiography in letters. Yeah. Um, wow, there's some deluxe editions for $600 in hardcover. You, no, you don't need those. <laughs> no. Uh, the cheap ones are $28.22. Yeah, that's, that's a great price. Okay, gentlemen, I have to go. I have to yeah, start dinner. Yeah, we want to take off too. Good night, Mel. So I will. Uh, it was delightful seeing you here. I'll talk to y'all later. Yeah, glad you came to see us, Willem. Thanks. Okay, honey. Bye, bye. Bye, bye. guys. Thanks, bye. Pete. Talk Good to you night, soon, Mike. buddy.